Hello and welcome to the first of this year's monthly lectures. Tonight we are joined by Duncan, Dr. Duncan Shrewsbury, who's one of our GP lecturers here at BSMS. So just to give you an introduction to Duncan, Duncan is a senior lecturer in general practice at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, where he leads GP teaching in years one, two and three of the undergraduate programme. He has a background in teaching and research before starting work as a doctor. Duncan works as an associate lecturer in A-level biology in an adult education college and has since taught at higher education. Much of Duncan's earlier work around student support and professional development centered around mentoring, which was recognized by a number of awards from the RCGP and the HSJ. Duncan's main areas of research activities focused on well-being, learning difficulties and disabilities in clinical education. For his PhD, he looked at dyslexia and doctors, he has more recently become involved in research around LGBT health inequalities. Duncan is passionate about general practice. When he was a trainee, he chaired the RCGP National Trainees Committee and supported national recruitment initiatives as a trainee. He has also led the development of the RCGP's wellbeing strategy and co-chaired the RCGP's newly established wellbeing committee for its first year. His role here at Brighton and Sussex Medical School will be to, is to support the ongoing development and delivery of the general practice component of the undergraduate medical programme. In 2021, Duncan was awarded the highest level of professional recognition from the Higher Education Academy, the principal fellow status in recognition of a sustained and substantial impact for effective strategy, strategic leadership in higher education, resulting in changes of practice and improvements in quality. Duncan has also recently been elected co-chair for the academic primary care from July 2022. So I'll now hand over to Duncan. Practice um, in this country. Uh, and it is absolutely crucial to the health and well-being of our communities. And I've got some really snazzy data that will help convince you about that as well. Oh. I don't think I can move it on anymore. Nope. Oh dear. <laughs> there we go. I can't remember which slide is first. So <laughs> um, whenever I talk to um, our students about general practice, I often show them this um, picture. Um, it can be a little difficult to see with the lights the way they are, um, but if you have Google on your phones, uh, you'll be able to Google the picture. It's called The Doctor by Sir Luke Fields. It was done, I think, in around about 1891. Good, I've included the date there. Um, and it shows a community physician, this chap stroking his chin here, in the heart of the community, in someone's home, during a time of intense suffering and distress. Again, a little challenging to see with the lighting, but you can see a concerned parent in the background and you can see that there is, there is a, a, a mix of things that indicate that um, the child um, in the center of the picture has been unwell for a period of time and is in fact towards the end of their life. General practice evolved from physicians working in communities um, and it, it, rather than working in hospitals. And because of that, it evolved in a very separate way. Um, we didn't have quite the same sort of jazzy equipment and tools and toys that you get in a hospital setting. What we had was building our relationships with our communities and being there and largely being there for people who couldn't afford care from some of the larger um, centers of, of um, healthcare in, in large cities and so on. Um, but that started to change back in July in 1940, I think it's 48, uh, where we had the birth of the NHS. Um, and that was, uh, that was announced to everybody in, in England with uh, the posting of this leaflet here, in which it says, the arrangement for general medical practice are the most important part of the proposals for the National Health Service. And I'll explain why. It relates to a concept called universal health care. Now, by and large, if you're trying to understand what universal health care is, you could, you could probably think of the NHS as a really good example of that. But there are lots of different models across different countries. 
The World Health Organization described universal health care as a means that all people and all communities can use care to promote health, prevent illness, be curative, rehabilitative, and palliative. Curative being to cure disease, rehabilitative to help people rehabilitate, regain function, even if they have a lasting impairment from illness or disability. Palliative, you may have come across that term before. Um, it comes from, I think, Latin or Greek to, uh, to cloak something. And it's used in, in the sense of palliative care when we're trying to cloak symptoms of distress, not hide them, but manage them so that people's uh, symptoms and, and experience towards generally the end of their life is less distressing. Do come on in. Interestingly, the, the values that underpin uh, universal health care, that these services should be of sufficient quality. So there's no, no trying to palm people off with a dodgy service of sufficient quality to be effective whilst, whilst ensuring that accessing the service doesn't completely bankrupt those families. And you can probably already imagine some examples such as our our, our colleagues over in America, where that would be the case, where accessing healthcare can be very much a, a bankrupting experience. Through universal healthcare, we hope to promote the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. And that this is one of the fundamental human rights that we all have without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. And the person there that you might possibly recognize from, uh, um, from uh, sort of other images uh, is Anurin Bevin, who was uh, one of the ministers um, in government at the time um, from a Welsh mining town originally. Um, and the NHS was, was his brainchild, if you will. Uh, and it was him who, who established it, launched it and drove it. So health for all. Back in the 1940s, we had um, we had a sort of, um, if you will, people got back together again after the war, uh, Second World War, and thought, goodness me, um, things aren't great um, for obvious reasons. Um, we had a number of different sort of reviews and, and reports that ran that suggested and highlighted certain problems, um, but these problems persisted. And so because of that, the World Health Organization convened uh, the Alma Atta um, meeting, if you will, uh, and that is where we got the Alma Atta declaration from, which was a call for urgent action, a political call um, to all countries, all developed nations to protect and promote the health of all people. And it highlighted the importance of primary care in doing so because it was the belief that inclusive community-led multi-sectoral or multidisciplinary, if you will, drawing on people from different professional backgrounds was key to promoting population health. So not just health of an individual, but health of an entire community to try and help bring the average health and life expectancy up. This was reviewed in 2018 um, at the, the meeting in Astana. Both of these places are in what is now known as Kazakhstan. Um, and it found that countries that had um, acted on the Alma Ata Declaration and moved towards a, a universal provision of healthcare, largely drawing on some form of community-based primary care model, not always with GPs. I'll explain some of the differences a bit later. Um, but they found that mortality in infants, children under the age of five, halved. They found that we had a general improvement in life expectancy and found decrease in, um, in all-cause premature mortality. So why is primary care important? I'm going to talk to you a bit about some work by a phenomenal researcher called Barbara Starfield. She, um, she was a pediatrician uh, and worked um, in the United States. Um, and they have, um, you'll be aware that they have a very different uh, means of accessing healthcare there. Um, and uh, what Barbara Starfield and her team did was look at different cities within states, different states within the country, and then different countries across the world to look at what provision of primary care there was and what relationship that had with the general health of the population. The amount of people that got certain conditions, they looked at things like stroke, which is where the brain gets starved of oxygen and part of it may die or, or become impaired. 
Um, they also looked at heart disease, so things like a heart attack, also called a myocardial infarction. Um, or, uh, and they also looked at cancer diagnosis and cancer care provision. Now, looking at um, the data from, from Barbara Starfield's work, we know that places that have a greater number of primary care physicians per number of population, they often use per thousand or per 10,000 population, had in general better health outcomes in the metrics, in the areas, in the disease areas that they looked at. Now, in some countries, such as the United States, the primary care physician might very well be a specialist. So you often have primary care cardiologists, primary care gynecologists, primary care pediatricians. So instead of going to a GP, and the equivalent to a GP in America would be a family physician um, or a physician in family medicine, um, but instead of a going to, um, to, a, to a GP, they, a patient would self-select. They would say, I think, I think my problem is gynecological. I'm going to go to the gynecologist. Uh, and they have direct access, first point of access to a, pediat um, a gynecologist, usually in the community. And that is quite similar to some countries in Europe as well, where they do have GPs. So, for example, in France, you have you have GPs that do a fairly similar job um, to uh, British GPs, but you also have differential access to specialties, but within primary care. Uh, so, again, you can you find that families can directly access a paediatrician if they're worried about their child being unwell, and again, that tends to be in the community. Now, interestingly, Barbara Starfield's work looked at what you do when you have a mix of people, a mix of different specialties in the community, compared to what happens when you have people who are trained specifically in generalist, holistic, relationship-based care. Some of the tenets that underpin general practice in the UK still today. So thinking about what relationship-based care is, because I've mentioned that a few times now, Dennis Pereira Gray, who was a former president of the Royal College of GPs, described relationship-based care as care in which the process and outcomes of patient care are enhanced by high quality relationships between doctors and patient, characterized by trust, mutual respect, and sharing of power between doctor and patient, usually over time. Now, some of those concepts might seem a little bit strange. What do we mean by sharing of power? We're not talking about plugging your iPhone into the wall. Um, when, when you're in any dynamic with anybody, there's often a dynamic whereby power is on a gradient from one to another. A chap called Eric Byrne, a psychiatrist, came up with uh, the concept of transactional analysis, which is a, a model of understanding communication. And quite often you may find that somebody is talking to you as if you're a child, and that can be a very parent-child dynamic. So we've got a, a gradient in power there. Sometimes you see that gradient in professional settings as well, such as a doctor and a patient, and paternalistic older models of care very much subscribe to that, the doctor being the person who had the knowledge and had the power, and the patient was there to access that. Um, whereas now we tend to strive towards a more patient-centered approach where we are working in partnership with our patients. As I often say to my patients, I'm never going to know your body and your experience of what you're suffering from anywhere near as well as you will. I can tell you what I think based on tests and books and sometimes looking at Wikipedia, but by far the most important thing here is you and what you're telling me. And what you're telling me might matter when it comes to trying to manage your condition. In 2020, the RCGP launched a massive report uh, and it sort of touched on some of the things that have happened during COVID. Interestingly, one of the biggest concerns that GPs have had around the transition to remote care. So, uh, telephone consultations or video consultations or even just over email is that developing and maintaining that relationship that is really important becomes much, much harder. And we know that a lot of our patients would prefer to have face to face care as well, but it doesn't work for everybody. If you're just calling up to get something changed with your diabetes medication and you're otherwise well in yourself, it can sometimes feel a little bit 
challenging to take time off work when you're well to go and deal with something that might feel a little bit administrative. So in those sorts of settings, remote care probably has a, an important role. Interestingly, we know from data that when you develop that relationship, you develop that continuity with a particular doctor or a team of doctors. So in, in my surgery, although I only tend to work a couple of days a week there, um, we are such a close knit team that we often sort of have like a tag team kind of approach. Uh, and if somebody can't talk to me on that day, they'll talk to my colleague uh, and we share everything through the patient records anyway, and I'll show you a sort of mocked up version of that in a moment. Um, but we continue that thread, that story. And we know that for people who do have better continuity of care, that they're often less frequently admitted acutely to hospital. Acute means when something is sudden, not necessarily severe. Chronic is the opposite. That's something that lasts a long time. Um, and often people will use acute and chronic to refer to the severity of something, but it's mostly about the timing. We also know that people who have greater continuity of care, they have lower mortality rates. And mortality, that's death, lower, lower rates of, of um, premature death. We also know that being a nice doctor is actually important. It's not just that it's nice for the patients, but we know that there's a relationship between empathy so the ability for a doctor to identify and understand and level with somebody's experience and empathize with that. So a study looking at patients with type 2 diabetes looked that, like, uh, um, demonstrated that those who scored their doctors as being more empathic actually had better biological markers, something called HbA1c, which is a type of change to your red blood cells in relation to how high your blood sugar levels are. Um, and they actually found that those sorts of markers improved um, in, in patients who had experienced doctors that they rated as being more empathic. So having continuity and having continuity with somebody that you think gets you is really, really important. One of the things I talk about um, when I talk to our students about general practice is, is that it, it hasn't always been great. We may be embedded in the community and we may have those relationships um, with our patients, but we know from times in the past, and the first uh, sort of example of this was the Collings report in 1950. So I was referring earlier on to some of the reports that, that looked at the state of healthcare of this country after the Second World War. And Collings was an Australian um, uh, physician who visited lots and lots and lots of uh, GP surgeries across the country, but also looked at other aspects of the healthcare system. And he saw that hospital-based medicine had really come on strides. Buildings were better, kit and toys and that kind of stuff were more sophisticated and able to do things. Uh, and staffing was generally better and more appropriate for the level of workload. But what he found with general practice was that by and large, there were still surgeries operating out of people's front living room and buildings that were not up to scratch were not appropriate for the number of people who needed to access that service. The number of GPs that were working in that environment were not matched to the number of people that they were caring for. They found that surgeries and general practice in the countryside was an anachronism. That's a posh word meaning it belonged to a different time. So, you know, thinking about what happened in Downton Abbey, that kind of thing. At very best unsatisfactory and at worst a positive source of danger to our patients. Now, it was after that that there was, I would say after that, it had started beforehand, but um, colleagues who felt very passionately about the state of general practice in this country and felt very passionately about providing high quality primary care to our patients, got together and essentially formed what then became the Royal College of General Practitioners, RCGP. It wasn't formed until a little bit later, about 1958. But much later than that, we found uh, one of our colleagues, Julian Tudor Hart, this chap here, GP in Wales. He, he looked at really, really basic data. How well are you controlling the blood pressure of your patients? Blood pressure is a risk factor for stroke, heart disease. It's also a risk factor for dementia. 
And he found that the availability of good care as described by good blood pressure control was inversely proportional to the need. Now, one of the, one of the sort of salient points about healthcare in this country, but also a, a sort of globally, is that you find that areas where communities are facing much greater levels of deprivation, deprivation in terms of levels of education, levels of literacy, you might be aware that the average age of, of literacy in the UK is nine years old. So a lot of the information that, that we use and we share might not be pitched appropriately for the literacy of, of or the literacy attainment of the patients that we're caring for. So looking at uh, looking at education, looking at looking at social capital, what sort of things are available to that community to engage in, to use, to promote their health, local swimming pools, council run gyms, parks and recreation facilities, as well as some of the more obvious things, such as the amount of money and, and sort of liquid capital, if you will, um, that people in those communities have. So communities that face greater deprivation tend to have much greater need for healthcare. You will find that there are people in those communities who have worse blood pressure control, worse rates of heart attack and stroke, worse rates of diabetes, and worse rates of diabetes that is poorly controlled. And Julian Trudehart's work essentially showed that, uh, where well, he demonstrated that link, the inverse care law, um, areas with deprivation have greater health needs, but also they have often the poorest provision of healthcare. Now, it, it kind of makes sense. If you've got this area here that has a huge need, they probably need more resource. And that includes clinicians to do the work, not just doctors, but nurses, physios, all of our colleagues across the healthcare landscape, but also more money to support and fund that and make sure it's resourced adequately. But what you find is that money doesn't follow need. And also sometimes the individuals who deliver the service don't necessarily follow need either. Now that's quite complex because if you're training people um, up in these, these, these medical schools and you know at this sort of time, the medical schools were largely in London, Oxbridge, um, well, actually no, they were slightly newer, um, but um, large urban centers. So you've got people who are training them, but when they qualified, they tended to work there too. So the communities on the periphery that had greater need had fewer people drawn to them to work there, as well as the fact that lower levels of investment from a healthcare perspective meant that people who did work there might not be paid as much. That might not attract the same, you know, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're an intelligent person that's worked really hard to get your qualifications, you might very well reasonably think, I want to be paid decently for the job I do. And if I can get paid more there than there. But general practice in this country. So I, I mentioned earlier on that it is, it is un under-resourced. And this data is quite old now. It has changed slightly towards a, a more positive rate. Um, but healthcare in, in this country receives one of the lowest levels of investment as a percentage of gross domestic product compared to other countries in, in the OECD, um, uh, um, which is the organization for economic, OEC, community development, I think. Um, it's a European organization that do lots of research um, around social aspects of uh, well-being, not, not just health. Um, and, and so we've got one of the lowest levels of, uh, lowest sort of proportions of investment in general practice compared to other countries that they look at, largely uh, those in Europe. In general practice, we see across England alone, about 1 million people a day. Now that actually has gone up. If you look at the data from N um, did, uh, NHS Digital, the number of contacts that we have in general practice, and that doesn't necessarily just mean face-to-face -face because now we have e-consults. You can submit a consultation through an automated service online. You can email into your practice, message through the website. You can also contact 111 and they may also then direct you into general practice. So the way that people can access general practice, it has, has vastly changed. 
sometimes not always necessarily in a way that helps people get what they need. The reason I've got a picture of the Titanic there is because um, sometimes when people are feeling a little bit cynical, they describe any efforts to change what we're doing as shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic, i.e. things are still sinking, but you've made the deck chairs look a little bit nicer for a little while. Um, now, I think I feel a little bit more optimistic about that. Um, so I mentioned that we've got, here we go, here's the OECD average in the middle there, that orange one. Uh, and we, have I put an arrow on there? Yes, I have, there we go, we are there. So we're, we're not, but we're by no means the lowest, but we are not, not doing particularly well in terms of how much we invest in healthcare. I'm sorry, I keep on wandering outside of the camera. Hello, you lot. Um, so we manage the care that we provide, whilst also having the one of the smallest numbers of hospital beds per unit of population. I think in this case, it's per thousand people. And we also have the smallest number, the lowest number of doctors per, um, uh, per thousand population as well. Nursing numbers are, equiv are, are equally distressing. But despite that, we do manage to achieve quite a lot. Now, the picture has changed more recently, and I'll go on to explain that in a little while. But in 2015, the Commonwealth Fund, which is based in Canada, um, looked at major healthcare systems across the world. So looking at the UK, the NHS, but also looking at, um, at the United States and all these other countries that you can see listed up there. And we came out top. We were ranked highest in terms of the quality of care, the level of access that our patients had to care, and how efficient that care was. Unfortunately, this year, the published results are not quite so good. You can see that we have fallen to position number four. Now, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a competition. I'm not striving to be better than Australia, but it does really disappoint that we have a very clear roadmap of what we need to do in terms of supporting the health and well-being of our communities, supporting the access that patients need to high quality healthcare. And despite that, in the succeeding six years, we have got worse. We have lost our first place. Now, there are a number of different reasons as to why that is. Um, and a lot of that would stray beyond the bounds of this talk, but I will hint at some of them. Now, general practice in the NHS five-year forward view that Sir Simon Stevens sort of commissioned and uh, nominally authored in 2014 was described as the jewel in the crown of the NHS. And you can probably understand why if you think that general practice manages 90% of the NHS workload. So very few people require onward referral. Now that's because GPs manage the majority of stuff. We are there as a gatekeeping role. If you need access to further specialist care, we determine at what level that is and which specialist it would be that you access. But that's not our only role. By far and large, the, the majority of our work is in actual disease management. And so we really do have quite a broad and sometimes quite sophisticated knowledge of some pretty complex things. I'm just going to introduce you to a, a sort of average day in general practice. If I'm on call, I'll start around about 8.30 in the morning. I'll get there a bit early because I like to faff, put the kettle on, make a nice cup of coffee. We have 16 appointments, 16 face-to-face -face appointments per surgery or session, morning and afternoon. Amongst the, the whole team who are on that day, we will also have the emergency extras list. And that might include some e-consults and some direct 111 booking as well. As well as that, as well as that, you have the administrative tasks of dealing with pathology. So that's results of blood tests, x-rays, uh, uh, microbiology tests that you do. Um, you have those to interpret and deal with. It's not just a matter of receiving them. You've got to think, what does that mean? And what am I going to do about it? You've got letters from hospitals. Now, a lot of them don't necessarily require a huge amount of 
input from you. It's there for your information. But sometimes, every now and then, you will get something that says something really important. So you do have to pay attention to all of them and read the, the detail just to make sure that you're not missing out on some of that stuff. We also have our repeat prescription requests and your tasks as well, things that the admin team might send you that need your attention. So once you've seen your, your patients in your surgery, you still have quite a lot of patient-related work to do, and that's before you start thinking about home visits. So thinking about our, our surgery here, after I've sat down, turned my computer on and got my cup of tea ready, you have a look at this sort of list. And these people come to see you in, generally in, in the sort of order that they are there. Sometimes things fit really nicely into a 10 minute consultation, but quite often they don't, especially now, because we're finding that things are just getting more complicated. Because we're getting better at treating people, we're keeping people alive longer. Con they are often suffering from more than one condition. Those conditions might interact or the treatments might interact. It's very infrequently a simple matter of somebody presenting with an isolated problem that requires a simple solution. And when that is the case, quite often those individuals might be helped and supported by other professionals. So you might be aware that in general practice now, we employ um, nurses who have advanced training in clinical practice, paramedics who have moved into primary care, physiotherapists who don't need a GP to refer a patient to them. They can see somebody immediately with a musculoskeletal problem. So, so quite often people with a well-defined problem can, where they can identify, actually, that's the right person for me to access, they're no longer in our list of patients to see. The stuff in our list of patients to see is more frequently the stuff that's a bit more complex. The other thing is you look at a list like this and you might think, hang on a minute, there are some things there that are a bit worrying and I want to prioritise. Somebody who has called up with chest pain, for example, you might think you want to call them to come in sooner or to call them to ascertain what that nature of chest pain is. Do they really need to be calling an ambulance or going into hospital? And all of that can interact with how, how your day flows. So quite often, especially me, but, but quite often you'll find that GPs don't necessarily run strictly to time. I see it as an achievement if I'm only running 20 minutes late by, by a certain point. So just to illustrate, oh yeah, and also on top of that, you might have reception giving you these screen messages that pop up. So halfway through a consultation, you're, you're, you might lose your train of thought because somebody said, I've got so-and-so on the phone for you. It's, they say it's really urgent. Um, <laughs> so it can be really, really complicated. When we talk about um, consultations and, and history taking with our students, I generally uh, say that, you know, it's, it, it has a, a broad structure of two people coming together with a common goal. In that space, you create trust where they feel safe to share with you information. That first minute that they start talking to you, start sharing and opening up to you is absolutely vital. And it's often called the golden minute. And unfortunately, some data suggests that doctors interrupt a lot in that time. We might interrupt up to about 16 times in that one minute alone. And that can be for a number of reasons. We think we're helping the patient get to the point by funneling them down one direction. We might even think that we're picking up on something vitally important and we need to identify and clarify right now. But actually what you tend to find is that by interrupting, you make things take an awful lot longer for somebody to be able to explore and explain what's troubling them. So when you come together, you have that common goal, you know, that it's implicit. The patient is hoping that uh, they're going to get better by the outcome of what happens there. And by and large, that's what we hope as well. Components that you would expect to see within a consultation, listening, you might see somebody asking some questions. You would hope to see somebody doing a bit more listening. And there's a very specific way of listening. There's lots of different ways of listening. Quite often we're listening because we're expecting to hear X, Y, or Z. And so we're filtering everything else out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Carry on, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
next. You want somebody to get to the X, Y, Z. But actually, if you actively listen and let the patient be in the driving seat, you can find out an awful lot more a lot quicker. This chap in the picture here, William Osler, is, is one, of, uh, one of England's uh, sort of quite famous physicians. And he said, just listen to what the patient is telling you. He said he, but he meant they are telling you what the diagnosis is. And it's true. We know that in simulated settings, between 70 and 90% of, of, of diagnoses are made purely on history alone without then further needing to examine or test or investigate. So taking a history is way more important than just answering, asking questions and getting answers to your specific inquiries. You build connection, Hopefully you show respect and compassion to your patient and you discover what their agendas are. And by that, I mean, sometimes a patient hasn't necessarily come to work out how they can get better. Sometimes they've come to work out how they can break that news to their kids or how they can manage to still keep an income for their family whilst something inevitable happens. And the sorts of questions that you ask and the sort of answers that you give would be vastly different for one of those agendas compared to the other potentially assumed one. So in that golden minute, Sir Davis Hadslam, who was a chair of the Royal College of GPs and then chair of NICE, you might have heard of NICE, it's the National Institute for Clinical Excellence or Healthcare and Clinical Excellence. They, they develop a lot of guidelines that help support clinical practice. He said that one of the most important things that you do in a GP consultation as a GP is to shut up. And he's right. You look for minimal cues. You'll often find that um, you might encourage somebody without interrupting them by nodding emphatically at something that they're saying or just even small little utterances like, uh-huh, mm, things like that. And those sorts of things are really, really powerful tools to use because you don't, it doesn't disrupt the patient's flow, their narrative, but it shows that you're listening and that you care and you're encouraging them to share more with you. Body language is important. And one of the tools that we use quite often to make sure that we've understood correctly is to summarize, to summarize back to our patients. And sometimes they say, yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. And sometimes they'll say, you've missed this bit and that bit there need to pay closer attention. Um, so I've sort of mocked up what your computer screen might look like in a GP session. Um, this is one of our patients from the list here. So our second patient uh, in our surgery, Dawn. Now, you'll be aware that there were some, uh, some patients later on in the surgery that had things that looked really alarming, such as chest pain. Um, and that might not be quite as important as a progression of a symptom for somebody who is well known to the surgery, but actually, no, a no dawn. Now I should say that all of the, uh, the names and patients that I use are completely fabricated, but they are a sort of an amalgamation of people that I've worked with over the last 10 years. And dawn has a condition called uh, myasthenia gravis. Don't worry if you haven't heard that before. It's quite a, a rare condition and it's an autoimmune condition. That's, that means when the body starts attacking itself, usually with a, a kind of protein called an antibody. And these antibodies attack a component of the joint between a nerve and a muscle. So we have a load of different kinds of nerves in our body. Some take signals up to the brain to tell it I'm in pain or this is going on. Others come from the brain and tell our body what to do. So uh, nerves that tell muscles what to do come from the brain through the spinal cord and they finish at something called the motor end plate. And here you'll usually have a release of something called acetylcholine and it'll work on acetylcholine receptors. In this area here called the synaptic cleft, you'll have enzymes, acetylcholine esterase, that will munch it up and digest it so that it can have its effect, but its effect is limited to the time that it's needed. Further stimulus would release further acetylcholine if needed. But you have antibodies here that impair the signal from acetylcholine. Get that out of the way and let's go back to Dawn. 
So from, from knowing Dawn, I know that she presented not that long ago with a history of a cough. At the time, it seemed like it was likely to be viral and it would probably pass and be quite self-limiting. But this background of myasthenia gravis is quite significant. People with myasthenia gravis will occasionally have flares of their condition where it gets worse, it deteriorates. And that might be necessary at those point to start initiating treatments either with things like steroids, which help dampen down the immune system, or with admission to hospital for intravenous treatment with say, for example, something like an immunoglobulin. An immunoglobulin is another protein that helps mop up some of the naughty antibodies, essentially. Now, unfortunately, in the past, when we've used prednisolone with Dawn, she's really, really struggled with it. It stops her from sleeping. It makes her gain weight. And indeed, you can see some features that fit with what you describe as Cushingoid, which is where somebody puts on weight on, on their face specifically. And you also tend to find that there is wasting of the muscles of the arms and legs, but a central distribution of, of fat um, because of the effect of, of prolonged use of steroids. We can also see that unfortunately here, we see HbA1c mentioned again, borderline, high risk of diabetes, query, does she need to have metformin? So prednisolone can, or steroids in general, can really mess up your body's ability to regulate sugar levels. And if that is sustained at a high rate, your body needs to release increasing amounts of insulin. Where does insulin come from? Pancreas, gold star over there. Sometimes I have sweets, but I was not organized enough today. Um, so yeah, the pancreas needs to in, uh, increase the amount of insulin that it secretes to, to try and have the effect on regulating sugar. But as it does that, the body starts actually listening to the pancreas a little bit less. Insulin starts being that, having that little, a little less of a kick and you become insulin resistant. I'm, I'm simplifying it somewhat, but it's, it's sort of what happens. So with Dawn, we've got a number of difficult problems. She's got something that actually probably could still be a viral respiratory tract infection. It might, doesn't necessarily, because she's got more short of breath, mean that it's pneumonia that requires an antibiotic. It actually could be shortness of breath because being unwell is challenging her body in a way that makes it harder for the, uh, the body to cope essentially with myasthenia gravis. Um, often when somebody is unwell, they need a slightly greater amount of steroids floating around to help the stress response. But for somebody who doesn't like taking steroids, that's an issue. And we know that with Dawn. Unfortunately, we also know that um, Dawn has got a child who, has, uh, who is on the autistic spectrum and has additional needs. Um, and... Uh, both Dawn and her partner, um, dad, um, work in partnership to, to, to help with this child and do very well without much additional help from outside, uh, um, outside agencies. But dad works night shifts, so often struggles during the day when he's on his own because he's, he's tired. Um, and uh, Dawn's parents are quite far away um, and, and aren't always able to help out. So the family situation's complicated. And we know all of this background stuff from having had consultations with Dawn over years. And okay, by the time you get somebody into your consultation room, you've taken a history, you've examined them, you've still got to save some time to document everything. That contact might only be somewhere between seven to 10 minutes the average consultation length is thought to be about 12 minutes, although we're only booked 10 minute slots. Um, but if you have that repeated over several weeks, months, years, you build up that story, that picture of what's going on in Dawn's life over time. And that's why having that continuity and that relationship is so important because you're seeing somebody who doesn't just need a quick fix of amoxicillin, 
they need some consideration about whether they need something else going on. Oh, I forgot that this was the next slide. Um, <laughs> when, um, again, going back to when we talk to some of our, to our students about communication skills, we often come across these, these numbers, which are banded about uh, a little inaccurately, um, but they go back to the 1960s, um, to a psychologist called Albert Morabian, who looked at how people communicate and how miscommunications happen in relationships. So how you can tell that somebody likes somebody else in a fairly close relationship. And in those contexts, so that very specific context, these numbers came out, whereby actually only 7% of what goes on is because of the words you say. 36% of what goes on is because of the way you say it. And over half comes from the nonverbal stuff that goes on, such as body language. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate into saying that proportion of stuff is what guides and rules um, all communication at all. That's not the case. But it does illustrate how important tone, pitch, pace, some of the other bits around talking, rather than the words that you use, how important they are as well as some of the other things that influence communication, such as your body language. Now, the detective work comes in through knowing Dawn, knowing her family, knowing her story, narrative-based medicine, giving her, giving her story center stage over a period of time and building up that trust and that bank of knowledge. Also knowing her condition, myasthenia gravis is not simple. Um, and it's something that would generally have support from specialists in, in tertiary centres. So I've mentioned primary care, which is the first point of access in the healthcare system, largely in general practice in the UK. But there's secondary care, so that would be care that is accessed through primary care. Secondary care largely refers to hospital-based settings of medicine in, in this country. And then you have tertiary care. And tertiary care is... Well, what do this lot refer to when they're struggling? They ask people who are in even, even more concentrated centres. So you might have just some of the largest cities in the country having tertiary referral centres where you have people who super sub-specialise in just the left big toe. And slightly being facetious there, but it is true. You, you find that people specialize and specialize very, very finely as, as, uh, as you go towards those tertiary centers. So knowing her condition enough so that you can manage it there, because the tertiary referral center in the middle of London is not gonna be able to help you with an acute problem, an acute decline. Knowing what resources are available locally, i.e. are there some people in the local secondary care system who can help you? Is there a way of accessing intravenous immunoglobulins if you need them? Is there a neurologist who has an interest in myosinia gravis that might be able to help? Or is there a specialist nurse? Quite often um, certain diseases and conditions will have a nurse who is so specialized in that condition um, that they take on the majority of the role of supporting patients, educating them about how to live and manage uh, with their condition. And they also guide changes in established treatment. So there's a lot of different things to consider. But then we also have the unspoken needs um, that and I think it's in the next picture, uh, the unspoken needs in the body language. So one of the things to think about is, you know, whilst you're there and, and examining um, or, or just talking rather, we're not even at the examining and investigation stage, but you're listening to Dawn's story uh, and you might notice that her eyelids are a little bit droopy. Now with myasthenia gravis, the more fatigued your muscles get, the more that those antibodies are blocking those signals, the harder being able to move certain muscles becomes. So if a really small muscle like the eye, uh, the muscles that move the eyelids um, is being affected, that gives you an indication that actually there's, there's, there's probably a significant amount of fatigue happening within Dawn's muscles. And importantly, that might also mean the muscles that control her breathing as well. Which is very important, of course. So we need to keep Dawn safe. What is it that we need? Thinking about the sort of help that we might access. Does that involve having a call, a telephone conversation with somebody? Of course, that doesn't fit within 10 minutes, but we do it because it's necessary. 
what will she manage as an individual if we suggest actually what we need to do is really ramp up your dose of prednisolone is that something that she's going to agree with and go away with and, and take um, to help manage her condition or is she going to meet you halfway and say well i'm not going to take that dose but i'll take this dose that's slightly higher and that's where listening and, and working out what dawn's agenda is um, is so important because actually there's no point in you formulating a plan that is not possible for her possible or desirable for her to follow and that's really important when you're thinking about keeping somebody safe so if you come up with a plan that she's not going to follow you failed to keep her safe but if you think okay well there's a compromise that we could possibly manage here but with that compromise instead of seeing you next week i want to see you in three days just to see how you're getting on so you might change something else to manage that compromise and keep that compromise safe I've already mentioned about hospital based treatment, but also thinking about how do you know that that individual is safe whilst they're not sitting in your waiting room or, or your consultation room? Is there anything that you can do around monitoring? Now, you'll be aware that, especially during COVID, uh, quite often we talk to people at home and we might see if they've got a blood pressure monitor at home, a thermometer, or um, an oxygen uh, monitor uh, to see what their oxygen levels are doing. All these sorts of things can provide really helpful information when they're used in the right way. Then also thinking about some of the other aspects around how you're going to keep Dawn safe and get her better. Is it hospital-based care that she needs? And if so, is that hospital nearby? Is it manageable? Is it full? Lots of hospitals are full to bursting at the moment. Uh, and how urgently we may or may not bring other individuals involved in. Are we going to phone them? Are we going to ping them an email? Are we going to send them a letter? Of course, with, with each change, perhaps expecting it to take much longer to have a reply. And who else needs to be involved? Does Dawn need some help with, uh, with things at home whilst she's recovering? Does she need somebody from the community nursing service to go in and make sure that she's able to, um, to monitor her, her vital signs or to monitor them for her um, and, and support her with treatment? So a lot of different things to consider in just that short space of time. So hopefully I've illustrated that it's far from simple. Um, and you will probably be aware that when the going gets tough, people get quite um, challenged and, and unhappy. And the job certainly isn't easy, but it can be incredibly stimulating as a clinician to really think on your feet with things that can be increasingly complex. And it's incredibly rewarding when you do see the, 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 the process and the outcome of developing that relationship with your communities and your patients. It's far more rewarding to build that trust with somebody and see that you are able to help them and then see the output from that help is that they've got better or that their family have coped um, with what's going on in a, in, a, in a different way that they might not have done beforehand. And to be trusted by your patients and your communities in that way really can be an absolute privilege. I remember when I was a medical student, I always found it really frustrating when people would tell me you're, you're, gonna, you're privileged to be in this line of work. Um, because, you know, with all the sleepless nights and hard work that you, you put in for it, it kind of makes you think, hang on a minute, I've worked for this. It's not just a, 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 a given privilege. But actually, I think as I've been in the game a little bit longer now, when I start to see that it's not just the nuts and bolts of what you learn, um, it's actually how you cultivate and curate those relationships with your communities that can be incredibly uh, rewarding and privileged. I wanted to share with you um, something that I was given it, during my GP training. I did my GP training up in Worcestershire, so that's sort of like halfway between Birmingham and Wales. Um, and when I was practicing there, I, I saw a patient only, only about three times, um, and it was largely about, uh, she had some concerns about her medication. She thought that statins, which are a tablet you take for mon uh, measure, um, managing your cholesterol levels, uh, she thought that the statins were stopping her from being able to walk. Um, and she presented very, very chaotically. So 
within a short space of time, people would sometimes think, you're not really getting to the point here. You're kind of all over the place. What's the simplest thing that I can break this down to and finish what's going on? Um, and I, I took a completely different approach because I thought, goodness me, I, I have no idea what, what, what you're talking about, or what's going on. Take me back to the beginning and just as a clinician, surrender to the fact that that is going to take longer than seven to 10 minutes. Um, and it was really interesting uh, to develop an understanding of the fact that she was terrified about having uh, a heart attack. So she really wanted to take all of these medicines that she had been told by people would stop her from having a heart attack. And this is because her son had died of a heart attack in his early 50s. And so listening to that story gave, gave her concerns a different weighting. This wasn't just somebody who was a, a little bit dotty. It was, it was somebody who had real genuine concerns based on life lived experience. Um, and it, it reformulated how we talked about the different things that she was taking, um, different compromises that we could manage and different interpretations of risk and, and protection. Um, and I was, I was very, very touched that when I was leaving that surgery, because I had finished my training, uh, she left a couple of things at the front desk for me. The first one was a picture of a horse. Uh, and she said she named this horse after me. Um, I thought, well, Dr. Shrewsbury is an odd name for a horse. Um, <laughs> and she said that she had, she, it was her favorite horse, but he was a bit useless because uh, he, he wasn't very good at pulling a trailer. I thought, I'm, I'm not, I think that's a compliment. Um, but also in a bag, in a carrier bag was this, um, with a note. Now she was from the traveling community and quite often women in the traveling community never learn to, to read or write. Um, so that, that made this very special. Thank you for looking after me and for being so kind. I will miss you. I have put two horseshoes. They will be the last that I will do now. She was losing her sight. Um, so she found it difficult to do fine work. Duncan, the small one, and one for your husband from my head horse, Moon. I hope you won't mind. I wish you happiness in your new job and thank you for everything. Love from an old gypsy. And that, I know it seems a bit soft of me, but that is one of the things that even when I have a challenging day or challenging week, I look at that and I think I'm, I'm, I'm still in it for the right reasons and I do still very much enjoy my job. Um, so I think that's it, taking on a bit of a whistle-stop tour about from uh, aspects of uh, healthcare models, health politics, um, and waffling about communication skills in general practice. I hope that's been interesting and I welcome questions. Thank you very much, Duncan.